Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are, whenever you may be listening. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number 10. And I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge. And I am so happy to be with you. We have quite the episode for you this week on Talking Audiobooks. It's not the episode that I planned, but I think this will be a good substitute. I'll tell you briefly about the episode that was planned for this week and why you're not listening to that right now. The original plan for this week, if you follow me on social media or if you're on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash talking audiobooks, or if you're in our group or if you're in some of the other audiobook groups that I inhabit then you know that this week on the show, I was to vacate the host chair. Just the audiobook worm, who you heard from a couple weeks ago on the podcast, came to me with a proposal. She said, I want to come back and I want to interview you. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I'm up for that. Let's do that. And so that was going to be the episode that aired this week, what you're hearing now. But the reality of the situation is that Uh, I've decided that we're going to do something different with that episode, and I will explain why in just a moment. Uh, What happened was we did the interview, and it went about two hours long. And while I could release a two-hour podcast with no problem, uh, I don't want to do that. I think that about 90 minutes should be about the length of these at the maximum. And I think that's kind of the range we keep it in. But, you know, uh, two hours could be no problem for, you know, someone who listens to audiobooks. Obviously, most of your audiobooks are going to be longer than two hours. So you're probably not going to mind a two hour podcast. And I get that. But the problem, besides the length of the interview, is that we cover a lot of topics that aren't really related to the audiobooks themselves. We talk about my blogging history. We talk about my history with podcasts. We talk about sports that I enjoy. We talk about time travel. We talk about a lot of different things that are interesting topics. If you care about me, the person, and are interested in the things that I think about or in my outlook on the world or my history or whatever it may be, but if you are more interested in just the audiobooks portion of talking audiobooks, then this show doesn't have a lot of that. It does have some of it, but a lot of it is stuff that has been covered on the show before with Ken and I when I did my interview back in December and things that I have mentioned in previous episodes since taking over as host. Now, it's good information in that interview, and there are great questions that she asks, and I do go into more depth than I have in some of these other places when I answer those questions. So it's not all just repeat information. And if you are a newer listener and haven't gone back through all of that archive material yet, then it would be entirely new to you. And so it does have value and it is worthwhile. But I thought because of the length, because of the contents that we covered and because of the familiarity that some of you are going to have with um, my opinions on some of these topics, that what I would do is release these as bonus episodes of the podcast. And that way, The people who are interested in sort of my biography, my history, my viewpoints on certain issues, you guys can listen to the episode and you will get all that information. I even touch on briefly uh, what this podcast will look like if I get my way. And that's an interesting sort of segment of the interview if you 
are interested in my viewpoints on where the podcast industry is headed and where I think this podcast needs to go to grow into a bigger deal, then I would highly encourage you to check out this bonus episode or episodes when they uh, drop. You know, it's one of those things where once I decided that we would have bonus episodes, maybe one, maybe two, uh, Ken and I will discuss how that is all going to shake out. Before you even hear this podcast, we will have had that discussion. But once we've decided that we're doing a bonus episode and turning that interview that I did with Jess into uh, bonus content, then we needed to find a show for this week. So I scrambled and I thought about it over the weekend and I came up with what you are going to hear today. I want to get into a couple of housekeeping notes before we move too far into the show proper. One of which is that you still have a few days to enter our July giveaway. We're giving away four audiobook credits from audible.com and these are going to be handed out on August 1st. You have through the end of the day, 11.59 p.m. Pacific time on July 31st to enter the contest. Now there's a few ways you can do this. Number one, email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and let us know that you want in the contest. Number two, you can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash talking audiobooks and you can like us there and you will automatically be entered into the contest. If you've liked our page already, you're already in. The third way, if you are a resident of the United States, you can text the word E-Z-ENTER. That's E-Z-E-N-T-E-R. E-Z-ENTER to 313131, and you will be entered into the contest. And what this means is that, yes, you could use all three of those methods to enter the contest and increase your chances of winning. So... Uh, That will be done on August 1st. We will be giving those credits out, and if you win them, you will hear from Ken as he is doing the drawing this month. You will hear from him, and he will send you your codes, and he will ask you for some information that we can share on the podcast and on social media and on our website, and that will be that. On next week's podcast, speaking of that episode... I will also be interviewing Felicia Sparks. Now, if you saw the Audie Awards ceremony this year, you saw Felicia as one of the presenters. And she is the APA Blogger of the Year for 2017. She is going to come on the podcast and she's going to talk about how one becomes Blogger of the Year, her own relationship to audiobooks, and a whole lot more. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion with her and doing my research so that I can do a proper interview with her and get all the topics covered. And we'll talk about her time at the Audis and different things. Uh, She has a great blog, and we'll talk all about that on next week's episode. If you want to add another title to your to be listen list, I want you to pay real close attention to what you're about to hear because we're going to go to producer Ken as we do every week on the show. And he's going to tell you about the PDQ audiobooks release of the week. And he is going to share with you a title for this week as he does every week. And if you're interested, I would consider uh, asking you to consider putting that in your Audible library and giving it a purchase and a listen. So let's go to Ken with this week's PDQ release of the week. And when we get back, we'll get into our main topic of discussion for this episode. So here's Ken. Thanks, Casey. This week, we have a very special title to talk about from PDQ Audiobooks. Take a listen. So long as these problems are not solved, 
so long as ignorance and poverty remain on earth, these words cannot be useless. These words set forth the soul and spirit of one of the world's great literary masterpieces, Les Miserables. Out of the depths of his pity for suffering mankind, Victor Hugo drew a compelling story, one that will live so long as bewildered humanity shall continue to grope toward the light. Tonight, WOR and the Mutual Network bring you the first of seven broadcasts based on this great novel. Each episode will depict some vital development in the epic of Jean Valjean. Orson Welles, author, director, and actor, has assembled a notable cast and offers an interpretation created specifically for radio presentation. Mr. Wells will play the role of Jean Valjean. And those sections of the book itself, which in running narrative bind together the dramatic episodes, will also be read by him. Les Miserables begins. Part one. The episode which is called The Bishop. The radio broadcast of Les Miserables was a seven-part radio series broadcast July 23rd through September 3rd, 1937 on the Mutual Network. Orson Welles adapted Victor Hugo's novel, directed the series, and starred as Jean Valjean. The 22-year-old Welles developed the idea of telling stories with first-person narration on the series, which was his first job as a writer-director for radio. Le Miserable was one of Welles' earliest and finest achievements on radio, and marked the radio debut of the Mercury Theater. The production co-starred Martin Gable as Javert, Alice Frost as Fantine, and Virginia Nicholson, Welles' first wife, as the adult Cosette. The supporting cast included Ray Collins, Agnes Moorhead, Everett Sloan, Betty Gard, Hiram Sherman, Frank Reddick, Richard Widmark, Richard Wilson, and William Alland. An hour before sundown, on the evening of a day in the beginning of October, 1815, a man traveling on foot was seen entering the little town of D. Nobody knew him. He looked ragged and mean. He must have come far that day, for he looked weary. The traveler went first to the mayor's office with his passport, and then turned his steps toward the inn. Who is it? The man who wants food and a bed. One moment, monsieur. Good evening. Is dinner ready? Monsieur, I'm sorry. I cannot receive you. Are you afraid I won't pay you? I have money. I'll pay in advance. I have no room. Well, then, put me in the stable. I'll pay you. I'm sorry. Well, the attic or a corner of the kitchen. I must have lodging. We'll see after dinner. I can't give you dinner. But I'm hungry. I've been walking since sunrise. Twelve leagues. I'm hungry. Get out. What do you mean? You heard me. Get out. But I... I don't understand. Monsieur, I suspected something when I saw you go into the mayor's office. So I sent my boy across to find out. Monsieur, shall I tell you your name? So you know. The traveler looked at the innkeeper, bowed his head, picked up his knapsack, and went off down the street. It's an epic and a classic, and a title that no audiobook collection should be without. And it could be yours free with a new subscription to audible.com. Check the show notes for more details. Casey, back to you. And we're back, and thank you, Ken, as always, for this week's PDQ release of the week. We're going to talk this week about your audiobook library. A friend of mine posed to me a question a few weeks ago. She wanted me to ask it on the air and perhaps do a show about it. My friend Amber wanted to know how audiobook listeners keep track of all the books that they own, particularly if they get them from multiple sources. We're talking about if you have an Audible account, audiobooks.com, Downpour, 
uh, if you use Scribed, what have you listened to, all these different services, TuneIn, Playster, all these different things. And there are other sources that are available if you have a disability, for example, the NLS BARD, Braille and Audio Reading Download Program, uh, Learning Ally, whatever the case may be. Bookshare is another one that uh, people who have a reading or physical or vision disability can use. So how do you keep track of all the audiobooks that you have in your possession? Now, if you listen to this episode, you know my answer. And Amber, being a friend of mine, literally outside of my family, there is no person I have known on this planet as long as her. But if you are new to the show or have a different method, we would love to hear them at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. But for those who have been listening for a while since even earlier this month, you already know my answer. I have a spreadsheet and I use it to keep track of everything I've listened to and everything that I own. And I've kept this spreadsheet since 2013. It is actually undergoing some major renovations after thinking about it for a while. And uh, what I've been doing in my library section of this spreadsheet is I've been entering the books alphabetically by title. And for a while that worked really, really well. But what I'm doing now is I'm entering them in order by the day they were purchased. That way I can eat more easily keep track of what I bought in a given year and it'll be easier to uh, group things and I can come up with some more uh, statistical information. And what I write in the spreadsheet in terms of my library is I have the book title, the author, the narrator or narrators, the genre, the length in minutes, estimated page count, how much I paid for the book, where I got it from, the book release date, the book publication date, which would be the same thing. I don't know why I said that uh, twice, but actually what I meant to say is the book publisher. So I have the book release date and the book publisher. I have the ASIN if I can find it. And then I have the date that I purchased it, whether or not it has been read, the last date that I read it, the last day that I finished it, and the rating, five to one scale. So that is what I put down for my library. And that allows me to keep track of a bunch of different things as I go throughout the year and keep track of what I read in a given year. I can keep track of a lot of information just based on all that stuff that I write in my library. But the problem with that is that I have a lot of books. I have 1,240 in my spreadsheet as I'm talking at this moment. But if you're not already doing that, Entering that many titles is going to take a while. I've kept mine since 2013. 1,240 books did not appear in my spreadsheet overnight. It's taken me from 2013 until today to add that many. So maybe that's not the best option if you've never kept track before. Goodreads is a source where you can definitely keep track of what you own if you want and what you listen to. But the problem is Goodreads is not set up for uh, audiobooks. It's a part of the Goodreads service, but it's not the highest priority that they have. Some of the books that I have listened to this year I found on Goodreads and I've gone through the 
editions to find the audiobook and had to settle for the Kindle or ebook as the edition that I'm uh, using on my Goodreads shelves, despite the fact that I'm actually listening to an audiobook, because not all audiobooks seem to get added to the edition list on Goodreads, which is a little ironic because Goodreads is owned by Amazon.com, which also owns Audible, and you can listen to Audible samples on Goodreads. But I use Goodreads to keep track of what I've read and what I want to read. And, you know, I have different shelves for different genres and things like that. I do use it in the same way, but my own spreadsheet gives me a lot more information that I find useful. For instance, Goodreads will tell me how many books I listened to this year, but it won't tell me how many minutes I spent listening. And for some reason, it won't always give me the right page count either, because the audiobook edition of a book will say something like, audiobook, seven pages, when the ebook is like 320 pages. So even the page count at the end of the year is really misleading if you listen to a lot of audiobooks. And I wish there was an audiobook service like Goodreads available, but I haven't found it yet. If you know of it, I would love to hear about it. You can email me at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. So a spreadsheet might work for you if you're just starting out, but if you have a thousand audiobooks in your library already and you don't want to go through the hassle of listing them all, uh, because it would take forever, um, maybe that's not the best option for you. And I can definitely understand that Goodreads has limitations. So Amber asks, how do you keep track of your uh, library and what you own and what you have listened to and what you need to? And uh, if you just have like Audible and you don't have anything else, do you use your app to keep track and that's that's all you do is keep track in the app and you're good to go uh, but again her collection is pulled from several sources and she's just looking for a way to get it all gathered together in one place information wise I don't know if she actually needs the books to be in one folder or whatever but she just wants a solution that will work for her and her needs. So spreadsheet, Goodreads, something else. What do you do to keep track of your audio book library if you call it from different sources? That is the big question for the week. And I have a little bit of a story about my spreadsheet, which we used to do the halfway episode earlier this month when we crossed the halfway point of the year for listening. I gave you a lot of stats that I pulled off of my spreadsheet. Well, after recording the interview with Jess, the audiobook worm, last week, uh, we were talking over Skype off air for a while, and she asked if she could see my spreadsheet, and so I showed it to her. And she was in awe, I think is fair to say, of my spreadsheet. She spent several hours going over it. Yes, I said hours. Uh, there's just that much information that can be gleaned from it. Going through it, she highlighted a bunch of books that she wanted to listen to that she wasn't even really aware of because... There's just so much out there, you can't be aware of everything. I can't be aware of everything. So she went through my list, saw a lot of books that I own that she thought would be interesting or would appeal to her. And so she added them to her be listen list. Hopefully, as she pointed out, she said, I think you may have broken me out of my book slump because I provided her with my spreadsheet and gave her so many things that she could try next. But whatever you do, you can get started with this free trial of audible.com, which producer Ken is going to tell you about right now. 
For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trouble. Time for the Caught My Ear section of the show. We have a few titles this week that caught my ear and got me to pre order them. And we're going to start by going back to the company that was featured in the first Caught My Ear segment of the show that I ever did back on the 2nd of June. This is, of course, Graphic Audio, which you can find at graphicaudio.net. They have released a new Marvel title. It came out on July the 24th, and it is called Marvel Spider-Man Forever Young. Of course, the new Spider-Man movie, Homecoming, came out earlier this month, and I want to say the same thing about this that I said about Guardians of the Galaxy, collect them all when it came out and was featured on our show back in June. This is not a movie tie-in or anything like that. It is a different Spider-Man story. Spider-Man gets caught in uh, the crossfires between a couple of gangs that are looking to get control of a tablet. And meanwhile, he has some problems of his own, namely that he's broke and his girlfriend at the time, Gwen Stacy, is starting to get tired of his excuses. All that weren't enough. His aunt may may be dying. And this is called Marvel Spider-Man Forever Young. It can be purchased from Graphic Audio as a download in MP3 and M4B formats and in the FLAC format as well for $13.99 or $14.99 if you get the flag, you have to pay a dollar more. And you could also buy it on CD for $19.99, and you could have it shipped directly to your home. This is a full cast performance, music, sound effects. There's everything involved in this. I became a fan of them earlier this year. I've said it a few times, but as we have new listeners all the time, I will repeat myself. I became a fan of theirs earlier this year. So impressed with some of the work that they've done in their productions. Marble Civil War is probably the favorite thing I've listened to all year from any company. Even though that came out a few years ago, I discovered it this year, and it's probably my favorite thing that I've listened to, and it came from Graphic Audio. They have a rewards program, so you can get money back on every purchase that you make and use that to apply to a future purchase. And like I said, check out their library. You might find something that you're interested in. They have sales all the time and other different ways you can earn rewards points to help uh, you save money on future purchases. But this is Graphic Audio's Marvel Spider-Man Forever Young. It is by Stefan Petruka. It is narrated by a full cast. It was released on July 24, 2017. It has a running time of 7 hours and 15 minutes approximately. And what you are going to hear now is a sample from Spider-Man Forever Young. This week's Caught My Ear title from Graphic Audio. You think you can make a fool out of me? Gonna have to go with yes on that one. Getting his goat is almost too easy. I had no idea someone's face could turn that red. One mob soldier aimed, about to fire. Another rushed forward, hoping to catch the wall crawler off balance. (laughs) Spider-Man brought down his fists on both and used their heads to propel himself back into the air. Given that cheesy trap, I have to ask, do your foes mistake your brain for fat too? He landed in a crouch and waited for the irate Kingpin to make his move. Not bothering to remove his tailored jacket, Fisk lumbered towards Spider-Man. He shoved his own remaining men out of the way with such force that one slammed into another. Sheesh! If that's how you take care of your employees, no wonder Mommy and Daddy never got you that puppy. 
Expecting the fuming kingpin to keep coming straight at him, Spider-Man leapt to meet him halfway. But Fisk somehow stopped short, defying the physics of his own forward momentum. One second the wall crawler was sailing through the air, the next... Both wrists were caught in a vice-like grip, his spider sense screaming, too late. The kingpin had reached out faster and farther than Spider-Man believed possible. Pivoting at the waist, Fisk hurled him straight into the web mannequin. No! Stupid! Stupid! I hated it to him! With no time to maneuver, Spider-Man felt his arms sink into the gummy sludge. Angry at himself, he pulled and tore, but only entangled himself further. His web fluid could assume three forms, swinging strand, webbing, and thick globs. The adhesive quality faded fast when exposed to air, but the globs he'd used for the dummy had a sticky, gooey center. Damn it, how many times have I made fun of some struggling crook tightening my web? Here I am doing the same thing. I could just relax and get free in seconds. But seconds were all the kingpin needed. His trunk-like right arm pulled back for the first punch. <laughs> Still stuck, Spider-Man managed to swing the hanging mannequin and himself out of the way. The ham-sized fist caught the exposed edge of the meshed web, sending the ensnared wall crawler into a dizzying spin. <laughs> Look at you now! Your mannequin put up a better fight! The next attack came with startling speed, but Peter's spider sense told him when to move. <laughs> the kingpin's fist flew through empty air and down into a heavy oak desk. Off balance by the strength of his own strike, Fisk had to reach backward to keep from falling. How long do you think you can keep dodging me? Arching his back against the mannequin's exposed surface, Spider-Man wrenched his legs free. At least until you change your mouthwash. Spider-Man's left leg kicked out awkwardly, allowing the kingpin to grab it by the ankle. He didn't see Spidey's right leg coming, though, until it was too late. The kick sent the kingpin tumbling backwards over the broken desk. With more of the mannequin's goo exposed to the air now, Peter pulled himself and his shirt free. Unrestrained, he tucked the shirt into his pants, hopped to the wall, and scooted across. Rising, the kingpin tried to swat him off with a contemptuous backhand, but thanks to his spider sense, Spider-Man was already jumping back to the floor. That was close. I'm still underestimating him. Fortunately, he hasn't seen everything I can do either. <laughs> Executing a mid-air flip that would break a normal person's spine, Spider-Man wrapped his legs around what he could find of the kingpin's neck and pulled him down hard. Did that hurt? Sorry, it must have mistaken your fat for muscle. Actually, it didn't hurt at all. His hand wrapped around Spider-Man's wrist. This will, however. Again with the squeezing? If he thinks he can crush my bones, he's... A thumb as thick as a hammerhead found a spot and pressed. Combat isn't just about raw strength, Buck. It's about knowing the right pressure points. Peter tried to use his free hand for a counter strike, but a searing pain shot from his wrist across his back and shoulders, causing his arm to seize up. The agony collided with his screaming spider sense. Black spots swam before his eyes. Something more than the night air hovered outside the broken window. Unnoticed, held aloft by silent rotors, a drone was relaying images of the gloating kingpin and his helpless foe to a black armored car below. The vehicle resembled an SUV, but longer and lower to the ground. At the wheel, the schemer watched the built-in screen, tapped his chin, and thought a moment. Then he placed a call. Silvermane, are you aware of the theft at the exhibition hall? Of course, it's all over the news. What do you- The kingpin is currently under attack by Spider-Man. It's left his defenses seriously compromised. Should you notify the police and give them the address I'm sending, I'm sure they'll have no trouble finding him. And the evidence they'll need to charge him for the crime. <sighs> the schemer went back to watching the fight. Copyright Marvel
The next title to catch my ear this week is a biography. It is a biography of a very famous and infamous person in the long history of Major League Baseball as a player and manager. Uh, Leo DeRocher was around for some of the most pivotal moments in the history of Major League Baseball, including the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers when Jackie Robinson became the first African-American player to play in the major leagues, at least in the sort of modern era. There were some that played briefly in the 1800s and uh, early 1900s, but certainly Jackie Robinson, when he debuted in the major leagues, he opened the gates for good and without there being any chicanery. Some of those earlier players were often passed off as being Native Americans or uh, something else. But Leo DeRocher was the manager when Jackie Robinson broke into the major leagues. And being such a fan of Jackie Robinson as I am and of his life and his accomplishments, uh, I'm also fascinated by the people that were around him and involved in that era as well. Uh, Branch Rickey being another one, but Leo DeRocher is the manager and was very vocal in his support of Robinson playing. But they also had a complicated relationship. And this title is uh, Leo DeRocher, Baseball's Prodigal Son. It is brought to you by Paul Dixon, who also wrote a book on notorious baseball owner Bill Veck. And this is narrated by Barry Abrams. 13 hours, 47 minutes is the approximate running time. Released on July 25th, 2017 from Tantor Audio. This is, as I said, Leo DeRocher, baseball's prodigal son. Uh, Baseball being my favorite sport to read about. I've said that countless times and will continue to say that because new people listen to the show all the time. So... There has to be some repetition, but this is another one that caught my ear based on who uh, the subject is, and it is on my pre-order list. As I mentioned, I'm recording this on July 24th, so we will get this in our libraries if you have pre-ordered it as well on the 25th, and if you don't, you can always pick it up from Audible. Right now, here's an excerpt from... Leo DeRocher, Baseball's Prodigal Son, written by Paul Dixon and narrated by Barry Abrams from Tantor Audio. Controversy followed DeRocher after each of them. Did his elaborate system of sign stealing and cheating contribute to the come from behind wins and Thompson's home run? Did the 1969 Cubs lose in part because Leo so demoralized his players, treating them unevenly down the stretch, deserting them during two key moments, creating turmoil in the clubhouse, and callously degrading them in defeat? Our offense went down a toilet, the defense went down a drain, and I'm still looking for a pitching staff, he said of his 1969 team after they lost the pennant. I could have dressed nine broads as ballplayers, and they would have beaten the Cubs. DeRocher had a profound impact on managing, with disciples who are now among the handful of managers in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. When I was a coach, my number was 52, Tommy Lasorda said at the time of DeRocher's death. When I became manager, I wanted to carry Leo's number because of my respect and my admiration for him. He was an outstanding manager. In wearing his number, I hoped some of him would wear off on me. He was brilliant, by far one of the greats. He was a gambling, aggressive manager. He didn't worry about people second-guessing him. He had an electrifying personality with an ability to motivate men. DeRocher was also one of the most hated men in the game, a distinction he did little to shed, and much to cultivate. Called baseball's problem child, he routinely attracted adjectives for aggressiveness. Combative, fierce, fiery, feisty, bellicose, pugnacious, cheeky, contentious, truculent, 
and scrappy. He was one of the fiercest bench jockeys of all time. As a manager, he unapologetically used the brushback and beanball as weapons of intimidation, and his victims knew who to blame when they got drilled. In September 1953, when DeRocher was managing the New York Giants, he told his pitcher to hit star outfielder Carl Ferrillo of the Brooklyn Dodgers. As Ferrillo made his way to first base after being hit, DeRocher wagged his finger at him. Ferrillo charged the Giants' dugout, got DeRocher in a headlock, and began choking him. In the melee, Ferrillo's hand was broken, and he was shelved for the rest of the season. At the time, Ferrillo led the National League in batting. DeRocher could also intimidate his own players when it suited him. Ralph Cannon of the Chicago Herald American wrote in 1947, he could infuriate his men to superhuman effort out of sheer hatred of him personally. Ty Cobb hated Leo because he constantly baited him with insults. Leo also played the bully to Babe Ruth, whom he called dummy when they were Yankee teammates. Ruth accused DeRocher of stealing his wristwatch. Years later, when Ruth's playing days were over, he was hired by the Brooklyn Dodgers as a first base coach. DeRocher went out of his way to humiliate Ruth. The relationship ended in a fist fight that began when DeRocher slapped Ruth in the face because of confusion over a signal. Manager Burley Grimes had to pull them apart. In December 1948, after DeRocher became manager of the New York Giants, Dan Desmond, who wrote for the Hearst newspaper chain, began a series on DeRocher that opened with, No man in baseball history has been so consistent at provoking antagonisms, developing hatreds, and setting up situations of violence. There is no temporizing for him. Once he has started an argument, he fights down to the finish. For him, it's all out or nothing. Less than a year later, the legendary columnist Shirley Povich, writing in the Washington Post, called DeRocher the most hated man in his profession. Yet, for all of the hatred he generated, he was a genius at turning it to his favor and making himself the center of attention. He thrived on bad press and the use of incivility as a means to getting his way. No matter where you are, said one of his friends, an advertising executive named Corny Jackson, you can stock a room with 20 people with better minds and better looks, and Leo will stand out like a neon light. As Harold Parrott, a former newsman and an official of the Brooklyn Dodgers during DeRocher's years with the club, put it, if he wanted to, he could... Next on our list this week of what caught my ear is a title that was released as a book a few years ago, but it's only now being released as an audiobook. It is again from Tantor Audio. It is written by Rose George, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. It has a running time of 9 hours and 33 minutes, released on July 25th, 2017. This is titled 90% of Everything Inside Shipping, the invisible industry that puts f clothes on your back, gas in your car, and food on your plate. And this is a look inside the industry of shipping. Uh, we don't really think about shipping all that often when we go to the store and we buy clothes or buy food. Uh, or even put gas in the car, we don't always think of how it got from point A to point Z, or, you know, depending upon how many points there are in between, it's certainly not just uh, from origin to final destination. There are points in between, and a lot of that is done through shipping, and it's a very complicated industry, and it has a lot of uh, pitfalls and, you know, difficulties and has a big impact on the environment and many would say a very negative impact on the environment but it's not something that gets a lot of attention and in this book Rose George takes a hands-on look at the shipping industry and uh, some of the 
things that have to happen for you to get those clothes and that gasoline and that food. And if shipping weren't around, we would be in an entirely different type of world ecology and economy. So I think this one is an interesting title for that reason. I was talking to Ken about this one, and he even noticed it when we were discussing it, and it had some appeal to him. So the rare caught my ear title that appeals to both host and producer of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. So without further delay, here is Pearl Hewitt reading an excerpt from 90% of Everything by Rose George, released by Tantor Audio on July 25th, 2017. They are the reason behind your cheap T-shirt and reasonably priced television. But who looks behind a television now and sees the ship that brought it? Who cares about the men who steered your breakfast cereal through winter storms? How ironic that the more ships have grown in size and consequence, the less space they take up in our imagination. The Maritime Foundation, a charity that promotes seafarer matters, recently made a video called Unreported Ocean. It asked the residents of Southampton, a port city in England, how many goods are transported by sea. The answers were varied, but uniformly wrong. They all had the interrogative upswing of the unsure. 35%? Not a lot? The answer is nearly everything. Sometimes on trains, I play a numbers game. A woman listening to headphones? 8. A man reading a book? 15. The child in the stroller? At least 4, including the stroller. The game is to reckon how many of our clothes and possessions and food products have been transported by ship. The beads around the woman's neck, the man's iPhone and Japanese-made headphones, her Sri Lanka-made skirt and blouse, his printed-in-China book. I can always go wider, deeper and in any direction. The fabric of the seats, the rolling stock, the fuel powering the train, the conductor's uniform the coffee in my cup, the fruit in my bag. Definitely the fruit, so frequently shipped in refrigerated containers that it has been given its own temperature. Two degrees Celsius is chill, but 13 degrees is banana. Trade carried by sea has grown fourfold since 1970 and is still growing. In 2011, the 360 commercial ports of the United States took in international goods worth $1.73 trillion, or 80 times the value of all U.S. trade in 1960. There are more than 100,000 ships at sea, carrying all the solids, liquids and gases that we need to live. Only 6,000 are container vessels like Kendall, but they make up for this small proportion by their dizzying capacity. The biggest container ship can carry 15,000 boxes. It can hold 746 million bananas, one for every European, on one ship. If the containers of Maersk alone were lined up, they would stretch 11,000 miles, or nearly halfway around the planet. If they were stacked instead, they would be 1,500 miles high, 7,530 Eiffel Towers. If Kendall discharged her containers onto trucks, the line of traffic would be 60 miles long. Trade has always travelled, and the world has always traded. Ours, though, is the era of extreme interdependence. Hardly any nation now is self-sufficient. In 2011, the United Kingdom shipped in half of its gas. The United States relies on ships to bring in two-thirds of its oil supplies. Every day, 38 million tonnes of crude oil sets off by sea somewhere, although you may not notice it. As in Los Angeles, New York and other port cities, London has moved its working docks out of the city, away from residents. Ships are bigger now and need deeper harbours, 
so they call it Newark or Tilbury or Felixstowe, not Liverpool or South Street. Security concerns have hidden ports further behind barbed wire and badge-wearing and keep-out signs. To reach the quayside in Felixstowe, I had to pass through several gatekeepers and passport controllers and pass radiation-detecting gates, often triggered by naturally radioactive cargo such as cat litter and broccoli. It is harder to wander into the world of shipping now, so people don't. The chief of the British Navy, who is known as the First Sea Lord, although the army chief is not a landlord, says we suffer from sea blindness now. We travel by cheap flights, not ocean liners. The sea is a distance to be flown over, a downward backdrop between takeoff and landing, a blue expanse that soothes on the moving flight map as the plane jerks over it. Finally, we get to the main event. While the other three books this week did catch my ear and all ended up being books that I pre-ordered, this one will be the first that I listen to. This one is the one I've been looking forward to the longest. We talked about it on the show before. In fact, when the narrator for this audiobook was announced, I touched on that on an episode of the show because uh, I thought it was newsworthy for a couple different reasons. And if you have been listening to the show for a while now, you probably can recall the episode that I'm talking about. If you're a newer listener, then uh, go back and check the archives because I think it was a reasonable discussion to have. But the book is from author Christy Golden. It is narrated by Janina Gavinkar. It is produced by Random House Audio, has an approximate running time of 10 hours and 22 minutes, released on July 25th, 2017. And as I talked about on the show before, it is Star Wars Battlefront 2 Inferno Squad. And when this one was announced back in February, I believe is when it was announced, I started to look forward to this one instantly. This book is a sequel to the movie Rogue One, which was released last year and became probably my favorite Star Wars movie ever. And it is also a sequel, or a prequel, rather, to the Battlefront 2 video game, which will be coming out very shortly as well. It is about the Inferno Squad, which is an Imperial squad put together as a result of the events that took place in Rogue One. This is the Imperial response, and this is sort of how the squad is formed and came together, and they play a big role in the upcoming video game. Janina Gavinkar narrates the audiobook and voices Aiden Versio, the main character in the video game. This is her first audiobook, and that's what I found interesting because, as I said, it's one thing to uh, voice a character for a video game and to do that character and to do it well. But narrating an audiobook where you have to do all the characters is a different matter entirely. So I'm very interested to hear this narration. Uh, this is the first audiobook she's done that I am aware of, and I'm very interested to see how well it goes. It could go very well, and I'm hoping that it goes very well because I have very high expectations for this book. Maybe too high. I've been looking forward to this since February. It's one of those things where I've had plenty of time to imagine how this story might play out and who these characters might be. And when you have that long, sometimes you set yourself up for a letdown because uh, it doesn't seem as good as the story that uh, you produced in your head or the things you thought would be covered in your head are not covered. Uh, and it goes in a different direction. And I'm very much looking forward to listening to this. By the time you hear this show, I will have finished the book. I have no doubt about that. I've said that a few times on previous episodes and had it not be true. But this time, if you follow me on Goodreads, you'll see that I've finished the book before you hear this episode. Uh, whether or not it will inspire me to move on to a new book, that remains to be seen. One of those things I've been looking forward to a while because this is a new perspective 
from this universe. We're going to interact with some imperial loyalists and some people for whom the empire has not been all bad. And sometimes that happens where uh, for some people, uh, a dictatorship is incredibly oppressive, but for some people it, uh, can be a benefit, as weird as that sounds to say, as weird weird as it is to think about, it can benefit people to be put under someone else's authoritarian thumb, especially if they uh, bring law and order to a place that doesn't have law and order. It doesn't seem like a relief. Uh, One man's uh, oppression may be another man's relief in some instances, and I think that's sort of the story that is going to be told in Inferno Squad. So without further delay and giving you more information than you probably wanted, here is an excerpt narrated by Janina Gavin Carr from Christy Golden's Star Wars Battlefront 2 Inferno Squad from Random House Audio. When the Death Star's super laser had targeted and obliterated Jetta City. The Empire had landed a one-two punch in a handful of seconds. It had destroyed not only the rebel terrorist Saw Gerrera and his group of extremists known as the Partisans, but also the ancient temple of the Kyber, held sacred by those who secretly hoped for the return of the disgraced and defeated Jedi. Jedi City represented the first real demonstration of the station's power. But that fact was known only to those who served on the Death Star. For now, to the rest of the galaxy, what had happened at Jeddah was a tragic mining accident. Things had happened with shocking speed after that, as if some galactic balance had suddenly drastically been tipped. The superlaser was again employed at the Battle of Scarif, this time wiping out an entire region and several rebel ships trapped under Scarif's shield along with it. Emperor Palpatine had dissolved the Imperial Senate. His right hand, the mysterious caped and helmeted Darth Vader, had intercepted and imprisoned secret rebel and now former senator, Princess Leia Organa. The Death Star's director, Grand Moff Willif Tarkin, had used the princess's home planet of Alderaan to demonstrate the true breadth of the power of the now fully operational battle station. As nearly all on the Death Star had been ordered to do, with their own eyes or on a screen, Aiden had stood and watched. By their treasonous actions, the rebels on Alderaan had brought destruction not only on themselves, but on the innocents they always seemed so keen to protect. She couldn't get the image out of her head. A planet, a world, gone in the span of a few seconds. As soon would be virtually all of the Empire's enemies. In a very, very short time, the galaxy would receive an implacable and thorough understanding of just how useless resistance would be. And then, then there would be order and this ill-thought-out, chaotic rebellion would subside. All the extensive hours of labor, all the credits and brain power spent on controlling and dominating various unruly worlds could, at last, be turned to helping them. There would, finally, be peace. The event would be shocking, yes, but it had to be, and it was all for the greater good. Once everyone was under the auspices of the Empire, they would understand. And that glorious moment was almost there. Tarkin had located the rebel base on one of Yavin's moons. The base and the moon were but a few moments from oblivion. Some of the rebels, though, were not going to go quietly. These few had taken to space and were presently mounting a humorously feeble attack on the gigantic space station. The 30 Y and X-Wing fighters the rebels had mustered were small enough to dodge the station's defensive turbolaser turrets zipping around like flies. 
And, like flies, this nominal, futile defense would be casually swatted down by Aiden and the other pilots in ship-to-ship -ship combat as per orders from Lord Vader. Within the span of seven minutes, Yavin's moon and all the rebels it had succored would be nothing more than floating debris. On this day, the rebellion would be no more. Aiden's heartbeat thudded in her ears, and she all but jumped down the ladder into her fighter, sealing her flight suit and pulling on her helmet. Slender but strong gloved fingers flew over the consoles, her gaze flitting over the stats as she went through the pre-flight checklist. The hatch lowered, hum shut, and she was encased in its black metal belly. A few seconds later, she was swirling in cold, airless darkness, where the distinctive scream of her vessel was silent. Here they came now, mostly the X-Wings, the Rebellion's answer to TIE fighters. They were impressive little single-occupant vessels, and they skimmed along close to the surface of the station, a few of them misjudging the distance and slamming into walls around the trenches that crisscrossed the Death Star's surface. And that is going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, thank you again. If you have uh, suggestions for my friend Amber and how she might organize her audiobook library, let me know at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and I will see that she gets them. Reminder again to enter our contest. We're giving away four free books. You can get whatever books you want from audible.com. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash talking audiobooks. You can email feedback at talking audiobooks.com and enter that way. Or if you are in the United States, you can text 313131 with the words EZ enter. That's all one word E Z E N T E R to 313131 if you are a U.S. resident and you will be entered that way you have until 11.59 p.m. Pacific time on July 31st to get those entries submitted. The contest winner will be notified in early August. On next week's show we will announce the August giveaway and we will have an interview with audiobook blogger Felicia Sparks talking about her Ascent to the title of APA Audiobook Blogger of the Year for 2017, her time at the Audi Awards and the APAC convention that uh, was held in conjunction with them, just her audiobook history as well, and advice that she would have for you if you were interested in starting a blog. I think this will be a good interview, at least I'm hoping that it will be. Well, until next week and all the great stuff we have for you then, I encourage you that to do what I tell you to do at the end of every episode of Talking Audiobooks, and that is to just keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy. Theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com. Follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio. Follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks. And subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors, like Audible.com, help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content, they don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you, and therefore the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.